ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to be able to address this distinguished audience on matters which uh, are of interest to all of us, Europeans and Americans, especially now when the war in Iraq is being engaged and there has been a rift in the transatlantic relationship which we all hope should not last. So my visit here into the States uh, with uh, two hats, the hat of the President of the European Union and the hat of the National Minister of Defense, uh, has a good timing because uh, I did have the opportunity to express to my American friends uh, the views of Europe and also to listen, which is even more important from them, the views of the States, so as to be able to convey these feelings and impressions uh, back to Europe in an effort to bridge the transatlantic rift which has, we have experienced in recent months, and which is quite unusual in the history of our relations. Of course, there have been times in the past when there have been disagreements, but uh, at least to my own political memory of the last, say, 30 years, there has not been such a big grief with such big expressions of uh, protestations and indignations, indignation as uh, the ones we have experienced in recent months. But I would like to talk first about the overall security environment and the responses uh, the United States and Europe have given to the changes in the security environment. There have been some new trends in security and foreign policy. The persistence of global security problems, and particularly the emergence of the so-called asymmetrical threats in the form prominently of terrorism, suggests that isolationism is no longer an option. Joint efforts of international defense and civil organizations like NATO, for, like NATO for conflict prevention and resolution are necessary for peace and stability. In fact, the asymmetrical threats we now face are more international in character than the previous security threats, and this is exactly what necessitates a stronger, higher degree of international cooperation. In this new world, we are presented with an opportunity to enhance the weight of the European Union in international affairs thus contributing further to peace, security, and stability. In this context, in the context of the European Union and the European Union's common security and foreign policy, the EU has played an active role, particularly in relation to the crisis in the Balkans and the Middle East. The events of September 11th have intensified further cooperation among the member states of the European Union, and particularly have encouraged the development of the so-called European Security and Defense Policy, the so-called ESDP. International problems, as I indicated before, require collective responses from the international community. The Iraqi crisis reinforces instability in the region and beyond and can degenerate into transnational terrorism. The main objective of the ESDP, of, European, of the European Security and Defense Policy, is to make the EU capable of independently initiating civil and military crisis management operations. The, the aim is that by 2003, by this year, the EU can post up to 60,000 persons to implement humanitarian, rescue, peacekeeping, and peacemaking missions, including peace enforcement. That is, to engage missions such as those that exist now, say, in the Balkans. With the adoption of the European Security and Defense Policy, it became also possible for the United States to reconcile its desire for a strategic presence in Europe with domestic pressures which you all know for greater burden sharing. For <clears throat> the United States, NATO seems to remain the core security and defense institution in Europe. It has, however, refashioned the burden sharing, uh, sharing debate by encouraging European states to assume greater responsibilities. NATO evolved as a crisis manager and peacekeeper. In a potential crisis, the opponent may be, well may be ill-defined and the allied forces less closely integrated than hitherto. The whole enterprise of dealing with new threats thus requires greater flexibility in both strategic thinking and operational response. In, the, in this sense, the recent evolution of NATO post-Cold War regarding its strategic response to those new security challenges is fundamentally changing its original rationale. NATO has gradually adapted to the new security environment, stressing its political role and reorienting its approach to issues of military doctrine, sufficiency, and readiness. 
in enhancing the capabilities of its forces and hence interoperability, the emphasis in the new strategic thinking of NATO was placed on mobility and survivability together with the ability to operate out of area. The new strategic concept reveals the, a dominant threat, threat from defense of territory to defense of interests and values. This is the fundamental change that has been occurring in recent years. During the Cold War, <coughs> NATO had tanks, had frigates, had fighter aircraft uh, designed to face a Soviet threat. In fact, Europeans would be conceiving of tank battles like those that had taken place in Stalingrad on other Minsk, or Minsk. Now this is gone. This Soviet trade, this territorial trade, no longer exists. But there is a question of defending values and interests in a much more sophisticated way than has been the case in the past. And uh, this uh, new strategic thinking necessitates uh, complete restructuring of NATO in terms of capabilities, in terms of, of arrangement of forces, in terms of human personnel, because now the threats could be asymmetrical, could, be, could involve uh, sending people, uh, sending armies in Afghanistan or Iraq or other places, or enforcing peace in the Balkans or elsewhere in the Middle East, but it requires a different concept of strategic thinking and operational response that has been the case, obviously, uh, during the uh, decades of the Cold War when the Soviet territorial threat existed against European nations. Now, so far as values are concerned, I think the core values that unite us uh, in the transatlantic relationship are well known. Respect of democracy, of human rights, and of course, the rule of law. From a European perspective, th these developments in NATO must be seen in conjunction with the evolution of European defense. As you know, from July 1st, 2003, Greece holds the pre 2002, Greece holds the presidency of, the, uh, of European defense, of the ESDP, mm -hmm. due to the Danish opt-out on defense matters. Our predecessor in the presidency, Denmark, is a neutral country, so it has, has, has asked Greece to exercise the presidency even during its own semester. So we are president essentially for 12 months, which is usual by European standards. The Greek presidents made every effort to achieve the goal of making a reality of the Euro army, of this force of 60,000 persons designed to uh, keep peace and make peace. Our efforts were met with success. We have dealt with uh, essentially three problems. The, pr the, the first problem was to ensure that this force had the necessary military capabilities. As you know, this is the biggest problem, uh, in particular in countries which don't want to spend much on defense, as is the case with most European countries. Not Greece. Greece, because it does face the threat from the East, is uh, spending a lot on defense. But if you talk about Germany, about France, about uh, Spain, about Italy, about Belgium, Portugal, the level of defense spending is extremely low. low. So, so there has been a um, lack of willingness on the part of those nations to uh, give the European Rapid Reaction Force the necessary capabilities. So we resolved this problem by exercising pressure on the European nations, on devising new financial methods for uh, financing and acquiring these, those, those weapons. And in May of this year, that is in two months' time, in one month's time, we shall organize a special capabilities conference in which all nations have committed themselves to supply the European force with the necessary weapon system, systems for it to become fully operational <coughs> within 2003. Now, another problem we have solved was a political problem. It was obvious that <coughs> the European force should not develop the entire range of capabilities since most of the countries of the European force were also members of NATO. NATO had these capabilities. So there should have been an agreement between NATO and the EU to, for uh, sharing these assets, for sharing these assets. It was more economical, more efficient. It would be ridiculous to duplicate the effort for the European force since the same nations composed the NATO forces. But this uh, involved a number of problems on how uh, the two organizations should stand along each other, uh, whether there would be equivalence in them, uh, how uh, the effort should be uh, promoted in a complementary fashion. Consultations, as usually happens among uh, 15 countries of the European, uh, the European Union and uh, many uh, countries of, the, of NATO, which are not also members of the European Union, that includes the United States, Turkey, and so on, were proved to be very complicated and very tortuous. Anyway, we found an agreement, and in Copenhagen in December of, of last year, we agreed 
on a text which unites, which establishes the terms of cooperation between NATO and, and the EU, and this problem has been also resolved. And lastly, uh, we have uh, also resolved a number of um, problems relating to the uh, industrial base of the European force, because as you also may know, uh, the European defense industry is fragmented, is dispersed, is not very competitive, does not supply a sufficient industrial base uh, for securing the necessary weapon systems for the European force. We're also taking steps to solidify the European defense industry by encouraging mergers, acquisitions, and stronger competitive units than has been the case so far. Now, the result of, the, all, all, of all this is that a couple of days ago, on March 31st, the first operation of the so-called Euro Army has taken place in Skopje, in the former Yugoslavia uh, Republic of Macedonia, when a European-led force has just replaced an international peacekeeping mission, uh, so that the first uh, so-called European soldiers, if I may use that word, are already uh, on duty uh, in fire on in, in the Balkans. Now, what are the next steps in our road to defense unification? The next steps <coughs> involve two things. The first thing is to enlarge and broaden the responsibilities and tasks assigned to the Euro Army. As of now, the Euro Army, as I said, is a limited function uh, army uh, designed only to face humanitarian, task, humanitarian assistance uh, tasks and peacekeeping. Now we want to enlarge this and include, say, terrorism, other threats, which means that we should endow the force with perhaps more people and also better and stronger military capabilities. That's the next step. A further step is more ambitious. Uh, as you know, now the European, uh, the European Union is drafting its new, a new constitution, not a treaty, the Treaty of Rome, which unites us as governments, essentially, in a union, but a European constitution, which could be a small step forward to a federal kind of scheme. Now, in that new constitution, we have the ambition, so to speak, some of us, to introduce a clause of mutual assistance, as exists in the NATO Charter, Article 5, according to which a threat against one member of the European Union uh, will be conceived as a threat to the entire European <coughs> Union. And this is the embodiment of the concept of collective defense. Now, of course, we shall see uh, whether these next steps will be taken, but a strong current of view in, in Europe uh, is, is inclined to take, to take those steps. With our unprecedented expansion to the east and the south, as you know, 10 more members have joined us. And uh, on April 16, the uh, official ceremony of accession will be signed in Athens under the Acropolis, yes. <laughs> as the um, uh, organization suggests. And the potential of further accessions in the future. We are building on Europe as a unified continent. With these accessions, if you see at the map, <coughs> you will see essentially that the European Union will coincide with the continent of Europe. But the continent goes beyond geography, uniting us by mutual interests and shared values. These values are connected to freedom, to social justice, and the transparency of our democracies acting in the framework of international legality. Of course, there is a much overlapping between European values and American values, say 95%, but there are issues uh, such as, for, for instance, the concept of international legality, the role of the United Nations, perhaps notions of uh, social fairness and social justice, which are different in the European country and the American country. There is no question that this is a more liberal country in the sense of the less fair economy than European uh, economies traditionally are. And also that this country <coughs> has a different tradition vis-a-vis uh, its uh, vis -vis international institutions uh, than uh, is the case with most European economies, in most European countries. Consolidating and sustaining these common values is among our priorities. We therefore want to deepen our achievement 
so as to reaffirm our commitment to a democratic and peaceful union of the European citizens. In the above context, which is characterized, as I indicated, by parallel developments which refer to the transformation of NATO on the one hand and the evolution of European defense on the other hand. Where comes the transatlantic security arrangement? This, <clears throat> I believe, until the Iraqi crisis, appeared to be quite adequate. In other words, that NATO and the European Union evolved, evolved in a complementary, in a, in a parallel and complementary fashion. Differences of opinion were, of course, unavoidable, but also, I should say, healthy. NATO and the European Union are active organizations, dynamic organizations, with a widely overlapping membership. Different perceptions regarding various national issues would inevitably lead to divergent approaches to them. In spite of that, cooperation was progressing, and a mutually agreeable reallocation of responsibilities between them seemed feasible in accordance with the principle of burden sharing that has also been promoted by the United States. However, things have now changed. Recent developments in Iraq have created a completely different climate that has certainly cast a shadow on transatlantic relations as well as on the thinking about <coughs> the security relationship. Let me elaborate. Right from, from, from the beginning of the Iraqi crisis, two different approaches were evident as to how to deal with this crisis. These approaches did not reflect the difference of substance. Regarding the nature of the Iraqi regime, there was unanimity. Everyone agreed that we had to confront an obnoxious government that in, had imposed on its own people a regime of terror, a government which had proven itself to be an aggressive neighbor and had repeatedly violated international rules regarding possession and use of weapons of mass destruction, the 14 or so resolutions of the United Nations Security Council, which have been systematically violated by the current regime in Iraq. Difference, uh, differences arose regarding the best way to deal with a such a regime, reflecting strongly differing currents of public opinion in the two continents. In fact, public opinion played a role in this evolution of this rift between America and the United States. If you see what, if you read, uh, if you make an elementary reading of the polls. There is no point in repeating what is well known regarding the varying opinions which arose both, both within NATO and have been expressed even within the Security Council of the United Nations in an unusually public manner with, as you remember, foreign ministers and foreign secretaries being present and exchanging <laughs> speeches as if they were speaking to the parliaments in their own countries. Greece is a small country. That is quite fundamental. And small countries have no option but to trust international organizations. Small countries have no power to impose their will. So they have to have the sanction or the authority of the international organizations being enshrined in the international system so as to have some way to protect their interests against the power of the stronger. Therefore, from the very beginning of the crisis, Greece supported action through the United Nations and tried in its capacity as president or president of the European Union to promote a common position among its members. In spite of the obvious difficulties, it's not difficult to sit with Monsieur Chirac and Mr. Blair on the same table, we managed <laughs> to salvage a fair amount of common ground. Developments have now gone way beyond this point. The difficulties and the clashes that existed among partners and allies have left a, have left a bad taste in both sides of the Atlantic which does not abide well with the transatlantic relationship. Voices have been heard promoting policies which may seem attractive, but in the longer run carry great risks for the international system and for international stability. A certain amount of bitterness was, of course, unavoidable. However, I'm convinced that unilateralism, <coughs> much, as, much as it may seem to give an instant satisfaction, is hardly the right way to proceed. The transatlantic security relationship has been fostered after decades of patient work. It is in nobody's interest to destroy it or even to weaken it substantially. Common values will continue to unite us long after the end of the Iraqi crisis. Following the recent split regarding the Iraqi crisis, some influential circles in, in the United States suggest that the UN is more or less a spent force, able only to deal with uh, minimalistic 
activities and functions outside the core domain of peacekeeping and peacemaking. Similarly, NATO too can hardly, according to those circles, be considered a reliable instrument since the principle of unanimity may shackle many initiatives as we have recently seen with the Turkish problem. Therefore, according to this school of thought, when a sovereign state decides to act in the world scene, it could proceed on its own together with those who want to join it, the famous coalition of the waiting. Although the frustrations inherent in the current working of international institutions, particularly the United Nations, are understandable, by passing those institutions will create in the long run grave risks for world peace and stability. Moreover, it will remove an essential mechanism of mediation for resolving international disputes, such as the Cyprus question, in which the United Nations contribution to its finding a solution was exemplary, despite the last minute failure to achieve that solution. Questioning the internationally established rules of behavior may encourage or indeed invite arbitrary aggressiveness on the part of states with less benign intentions than either the United States of America or any member of the European Union. It is therefore essential after the end of the Iraqi crisis to redefine the legal framework for dealing with issues such as terrorism or possession of weapons of mass destruction so as to prevent the reemergence of the conflicts <coughs> we have recently experienced. <coughs> Something, in fact, that uh, Mrs. Rice and myself in our recent discussion in Washington uh, seem to agree, that we should sit down and rethink some issues regarding the legal framework for dealing with the asymmetrical threats after the Iraqi war is ended, so as to not to repeat the experience we have been gone through during this Iraqi crisis. And perhaps a more global rethinking of the role and the functioning of the United Nations is also in order. But this is theory. This is long term. What should we do in the short term? I think in the short term, there is one specific task. We should involve the United Nations in the arrangements that will have, be, uh, have to be put in place for the administration of Iraq after the war. This is necessary not only for reasserting its role following the challenge it has faced, but also for securing international support for Iraq's transition to democracy. The United Nations involvement will contribute to the legitimacy of post-war government arrangements in Iraq, both vis-a-vis -vis its own people <laughs> but also vis-a-vis -vis its neighbors, because the neighbors will respect the new regime in Iraq in a much stronger fashion if it is established with the authority of the United Nations than if it is seen as the puppet of just a single power, however big that power may be. More generally, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, defense to be effective must rest on the combination of military power and diplomatic support. Any country that tries to, tries to act alone will, sooner or later, face fundamental difficulties in promoting its defense policy and pursuing its overall objectives. Security is an imponderable. It, it can only be assured through a combination of multiple elements, including military capability, political cooperation, and common policies in order to face any possible danger. Look at Israel. Does military power ensure stability and security? The answer is no. You need more than military power to secure stability. And the example of Israel, I think, should be transposed to most other international problems and to most other security threats and challenges. In concluding, security partnership to maintain stability is among our priorities. <coughs> Europe is prepared to take share of responsibilities by building a stronger security and defense policy. This is the main political message. The current Iraqi crisis in particular and the broader Middle East conflict highlight, highlight the need for faster steps to be taken in that direction. In this context, Greece will contribute 
to maintaining and strengthening the transatlantic relationship. Continued <laughs> commitment to this partnership is essential for responding to the new global challenges. Thank you very much.